Welcome to Reading Recap 2. And yes, I am wearing the same outfit because I've recorded these in the same days. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go ahead and do the same thing like we did in the last video. You're, we're going to take the time. I'm going to go through the assigned reading and point out what I think are the most important things for you to focus on as you go through that reading. So first, you need to open up to page 182, and you see there's a little section about DNA structure. And then if you go on 183, you see this thing. This is referred to as Shargraf's rules. Above Shargraf's rules is numbers one through four. Know the four rules. Know the four rules. <laughs> I don't know how to say that, but know the four rules. Um, I'm 99% sure that you have a question like this that's going to be definitely on the exam. And I think I have an example one, and that will be on the discussion worksheets. Okay, so as you go through 183 on that page, there's a, another term that stands out that I think is really important for you to focus on, that's anti-parallel. Understand what anti-parallel means. So we already talked about directionality, right? DNA runs from five prime to three prime. And then so anti-parallel is that you have the other strand running the opposite direction, but like next to it. So that's three prime to five prime. And you can see a really good example of that on the figure on page 183, that's figure 614. Some of these other minor details, they're good to know, be able to look up, but we won't be testing them extensively. Like how, we, but don't, don't spend time trying to memorize how large the major groove is, how large the minor groove, groove is, um, how often are you gonna see a left-handed versus a, a right-handed um, structure. Um, those aren't details that are super important. They're just good to be aware of. So another thing I do want to point out on page 184, if you scroll down amongst all these little details, if you get to the bottom, you see a sentence that says, consequently, DNA double helices that are 10 or more base pairs long are quite stable at room temperature. So this is going to lead us into one of the topics that is going to be important in the reading is stability of DNA and what makes it stable. So the fact that you have so many interactions in a DNA strand, the, more, the longer that DNA is the more stable it's going to be because it has more and more base pairing occurring. And so that's why if you say 10 base pairs are more long, you know that cutoff about 10, it makes it very, very stable. Okay, so we went 22, we're at 184, we basically finished off 185. Um, I have a little asterisk here that says just know that DNA transformation because each strand can basically be a template to make another strand. That's gonna be important. Okay, let's go to 196 to 199. 196, 199. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about the, the process of denaturation and renaturation or what we call annealing. And so this can happen in two ways. So basically you have DNA, you have two strands, they're together because of these hydrogen bonds between the base pairs, you know, the base pairing. But when we need to replicate DNA, like these bonds have to be broken and DNA has to come apart. And there are several things that can impact the ability of this DNA to stay stuck together or to come apart. So say for example, if you raise the temperature, DNA, if it's, if it's hot enough, the DNA will do what we call is a denature and come apart into two strands. And then if you pull it back down, it'll renature or anneal. So normally this is a one-step process as long as some of the DNA is already stuck together. So think of like a zipper if you don't. So if your zipper, if you partially zip it and you need to zip it back up, it goes zoop, one step. But say you unzip your jacket completely and you don't even have the thing latched, then you have to first like latch it and then you can zip it. So it's, it's, it's two steps. And you can actually see an example of that in figure 628 about reversible denaturation of DNA. So DNA can apart and go back together multiple, multiple times. And then there are actual several things that impact the ability of the DNA to come apart, which is what we call the melting point. So I want to focus on, okay, actually, one quick detail, quick detail on page 197, um, the hypochromic effect. Know what it is. I'm just going to say that, know what it is. Okay. And then for the melting temperature, we're going to we're going to spend a little bit of, of time on this because there are multiple things that can impact the melting temperature. Um, I plan on going over this in lecture, having some questions in your homework on it, also in the discussion section. You can expect to see it on the exam for sure. So don't miss it. I'll be very disappointed if you miss something about the melting point. So 
page 197, you'll start seeing a lot of information about how different, I guess, variables can affect the melting temperature of DNA. So GC content, so that's the base pair of guanine and cytosine. They actually have three hydrogen bonds between each other, so they're stronger than like the two hydrogen bonds you see between like an A and T. So if you have more GC, then you have a higher melting temperature. So that's actually like biochemical um, characteristics of the DNA that can change the melting temperature. There's another point that's downstream of that paragraph where it talks about RNA duplexes and DNA duplexes. So interestingly enough, RNA is normally single-stranded. But if RNA is double-stranded, it is actually more stable than you. So RNA to RNA, super, super, super stable. RNA to DNA, a little bit less stable than DNA itself is the least stable of those three. So that's stability of the two molecules being together. And I want you to remember this is different from um, the stability of RNA by itself or DNA by itself. RNA, because of that free um, two prime hydroxyl can get degraded and hydrolyzed in basic conditions. So you lose it and it's degraded. But when you have an RNA duplex, it is very stable and more difficult to denature and takes a lot more temperature. So keep those two concepts separated in your mind. Where are we at? Yeah, and then we've got two more pages in this in this reading block. Ha ha ha. So probes. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time like walking you through this, but focus your reading on page 198 and really understanding how different nucleic acids can be used as probes. So how like basically how does probing work, right? You'd have an RNA or DNA molecule that is labeled something that we can see. It can be um fluorescent, it could be um. What, what, what do you call that when radioactive? It'd be radioactive, but essentially it's something that you would be able to visualize in some sort of way. And then you take that probe, put it in with DNA, and if it anneals, then we know that, hey, um, the DNA that we're looking for is there. So these types of probe assays can be very, very specific, and you can even look for differences between one nucleotide or base pair of trying to probe for a, a mutation. So spend time in this area reading and understanding. Okay, cool. So now I want to go to page two of four. Okay, so page two of four is the how we know. So I want to let you know you are not going to be quizzed on this information but I do want you to read through it and understand that essentially one scientist brought some data, made some data, x-ray diffraction off of the DNA. They're able to measure the different spaces based off that diffraction data and then use that to build a model of DNA that we know now. All right, let's go to page 45, 46. 45, 46. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so page 45 and 46, we had actually stopped here in reading one, and I kept going into this concept because it's so important, even though you hadn't read it yet. But page 45 and 46 talks about oxytrophs, also has a figure that I mentioned in the reading last week. Understand oxytrophs, understand what it is. This is going to be something that's going to come up in class over and over and over again, so please take the time to know it. Okay, I want to go to 259. Okay, cool. So our 259 to 262. Okay, so this basically describes what a genome is and how we understand what a genome is. And then, so this is one of those things where like, there's a lot of pages with a lot of information, but really you can distill it down to, I want you to understand and just know what a genome is is. I want you to have awareness, but it, we're not going to apply too much of this in, in class. Make sure we're not missing anything. Okay. And then, so there's going to be, 
some more details about the human genome. If you get to page, when you get to page 267, I want you to know the difference between an intron and an exon. And introns are basically like the coding segments, what code for actual functional proteins. And then realize that um, a very small amount of our genome is actually coding for a protein. That a lot of the genetic code is for a whole bunch of other stuff. I want you to be aware of that. And so maybe just kind of think to yourself, why in the world would we have so much genetic information then very little of it is actually coding for, um, for proteins? So that can be visualized on page 268, figure 86, where you get a snapshot of the human genome kind of represented in pie charts. And I think this is really, really interesting to un understand because you see how our genetic information is essentially um, not what people initially assumed it to be. I do also want you to understand trans transposons. They're these little molecular <laughs> elements that can like jump from... Um, one piece of DNA, one piece of DNA to another piece of DNA. Also, just know some of the basic, um, what do you call it? There's some basic terminology that I want you to be aware of. You might see this terminology pop up in exam questions. So, say if I say a SNP, it's a single nucleotide polymorphism. So, what in the world is a SNP? What is a single nucleotide polymorphism? This is going to be a, a mutation in like one place. In, in the genome. So understanding just what that is, knowing the nomenclature is going to be important. So same thing with like simple sequence repeats. Like if you see SSSRs in a question, do you know what SSSR is? So that way question doesn't throw you off. Also good to know just the term haplotypes and understanding what a haplotype is. So think of like a group of SNPs or single type polymorphisms that are inherited for groups. This is actually how we do tracing of genetic ancestry, it's looking for groups of SNPs that are inherited together. So that would be a haplotype. Okay, so let's go to 204. So I did 204 already. This is having the structure of DNA. Okay. And then 45, 46. Doki. Let's see. Yeah, I know I did that in 42. And this is the downside to using like a physical textbook. <laughs> okay, we have 45, 46 already also. Um, okay, so I think we're at 267, 260. Oh, we're, we're at the very end. That was the last one. Okay, so 292, and then that's it for the reading today. Ooh, this one's a good one. Okay, so 292 is a how we know. And so the genome, of course, is very, very, very large. And I think this is such a cool story to read and understand how we're able to sequence full genomes because it used to be laborious, really, really time intensive, super difficult. But one person that was like, um, Dr. Craig Venter said, you know, take a different approach. Let's just shotgun measure, just sequence everything and then figure out if we can puzzle it, piece it back together using computational approaches. And that's what they did. So I suggest you read the How We Know. You may or may not have a question on um, how we understand or how we're able to sequence full, full genomes, but this is good information for you to focus on. Okay, so that is all the reading for week one. So hopefully you can take this reading, doing the reading quizzes, the baseline information. Um, the application that we do in class will help you focus on the core concepts I really want you to take home and apply the following week. Make sure you take these concepts and you will have some practice questions on the homework. Do the homework. Do the homework before you go to the discussion section. And then at your discussions, you can go through some of these concepts again. So you'll see this happening every week. And hopefully these reading recaps will help you in your studying. All right, see you later.